Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu, and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. As kids across the state head back to school, handheld metal detectors are scheduled to arrive later this month. Times have changed and sometimes we have to take those precautions even though it may feel like it's a little uh, difficult. Ahead we look at what administrators are doing to make schools safer. And teachers are preparing to keep kids safe as well. We go to Brown County where educators are learning new strategies to better protect their students. The first genetically modified meat to be sold for human consumption may be salmon raised right here in Indiana. Plus, as part of our new series, Inquire Indiana, we answer one Hoosier's question about where Salt Creek got its name. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, hundreds of schools across Indiana are waiting on handheld metal detectors to arrive. It's part of the state's plan to increase safety at schools following shootings across the country this year, including one in Noblesville. But as Barbara Brozier reports, the new resources provide some legal challenges for districts. North Lawrence Community Schools is among the districts that requested metal detectors, which the state is providing free of charge to any district that requests them. But it will be a while before they put them to use. As parents drop their kids off at Bedford Middle School for the first day of classes this week, some say they have peace of mind. This year, the district hired four full-time resource officers for its schools, and one is stationed here. It makes it a lot more safer and better. It's one of several changes the district is making to double down on security in the wake of recent school shootings. The superintendent also requested 20 free handheld metal detectors from the state, which are scheduled to arrive later this month. There was a time when uh, in our community that you could have unlocked doors and keep your doors open day and night. Uh, times have changed and sometimes we have to take those precautions even though it may feel like it's a little uh, difficult. While Connor says the district is still ironing out the details, administrators will likely only use the metal detectors on students when there's reasonable suspicion that someone is carrying something that could be harmful. I have asked legal counsel to go ahead and uh, uh, develop a policy protocol for us and then uh, working with school board and uh, informing students and staff and uh, then our community in general. It's a challenging situation for schools. They're now having to expand their roles in ensuring student safety. The Monroe County Community School Corporation hosted a conversation about the metal detectors earlier this month. Leaders here say they haven't requested any yet, but the district could get up to 144. At this point in time, the board wanted to hear from our community, and that's exactly what we're doing. And so we'll be looking at this information to make that determination. Some parents voiced concerns during the meeting that the metal detectors could alter the learning environment, which is something that also worries DeMuth. When you talk about using a scanner, uh, it's the same feeling as you were to get if you, when you go into an airport or when you go into a county building. Um, that sets a whole different atmosphere. And again, when we're dealing with children, we've got to be very careful if we make that decision. People have challenged the use of similar metal detectors in schools in other states. That led the Indiana School Boards Association to provide districts with guidance as they look to craft their policies. The organization recommends schools use the wand 
responds if there's reasonable suspicion that a student is carrying a weapon or for what's called an administrative search. Those have to be random and can't single out specific groups. We gave them an option to say, you know, they can scan them when they come into the school and it might be every third child or every third student, um, or they could choose to, you know, do a random scan during the day. And there's a long list of procedures that must be in place if a school goes that route. For example, the metal detector can't touch a student's body, and the person conducting the search must be the same sex as the student. School districts still have some time to sort through the complicated legal issues before metal detectors arrive. And while some worry about the potential unintended consequences, districts that requested them say, sadly, they're necessary. If there is a reasonable concern that someone has something on their person that could truly do harm to someone else, uh, I want to take action to make sure that we remove that threat. Now, in other states where the use of these metal detectors has been challenged before, police officers were the ones who were administering the searches. That's not going to be possible for all of these smaller Indiana school districts. So the school boards association is recommending that administrators be trained in how to use the metal detectors. Reporting in Bedford, I'm Barbara Brozier for Indiana News Desk. Now, those metal detectors are one of several steps the schools, the state and schools are taking to keep kids safe. But as Indiana Public Broadcasting's Jeannie Lindsay reports, another essential piece remains. How can teachers prevent or better prepare for the worst case scenario? A week before school started in Brown County, class was already in session for this group of educators, law enforcement and mental health professionals. Today's lesson focuses on what to do, like run, hide, or fight, in case of a hostile aggressor, like an active shooter. That's going to, if the door's locked and it's dark, that the shooter's going to maybe pass our room, and that, they're the safest that way. Kirk Reitzman teaches at Brown County High School. He's describing the intruder training he's received before. In all three districts he's taught in, it's mostly focused on only one of the three parts, the lockdown. We have to be the ones that are protecting the students and we have to take those measures and quite honestly just sitting there and kind of waiting for somebody to come in is not enough to protect them. So teachers and administrators say more thorough training with the run, hide, fight strategies gives them tools to better protect themselves and their students. If you think the attacker's nearby and you can't run, then you need to make a decisive decision and hide. The same type of training used in Noblesville schools, where teacher Jason Seaman tackled a shooter as the student opened fire in his classroom earlier this year. No one died, and the shooter injured only two people, including Seaman. I want to make it clear that uh, my actions on that day, uh, in my mind, were the only acceptable actions I could have done given the circumstances. Um, I deeply care for my students and their well-being. It's a hard truth for some to consider the possibility of taking similar actions in their classrooms, but elementary school principal Kelly Bruner says everyone agrees on the bottom line. It is nerve-wracking to think about that happening, but our number one priority is the safety of the students. School shootings have spurred a lot of talk about safety this year, mostly to harden up schools. The state has made more money available for schools to amp up security. Some schools have even made moves to offer certain staff access to guns. But educators and other officials have also stressed the importance of another softer side of safety. In an interview earlier this year, State Superintendent of Public Instruction Jennifer McCormick said mental and behavioral health remains a key part of the conversation. That whole piece, the whole child well-being piece, we're looking at our systems of care in Indiana. Not all counties are where we need to be, so we're looking at gaps. Future teachers want to close those gaps too. Dan Melnick at IU's School of Education says student voice drives professional development events and students want to focus on what can make them a great teacher and make their schools safer, building relationships. They understand there is a need for school safety. It's not that they don't feel unsafe right now. It's more that they want to know how to better a school, how to better a situation when they get there. So as schools lock more doors to keep people safe, educators hope to open others for the same reason. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Jeannie Lindsay. 
Now for headlines, we go over to Lindsay Wright, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Hey, Joe, thanks. State officials say meeting the August 31st deadline for completion of I-69 Section 5 depends on the weather. Extra days were built into the schedule for rain and inclement weather, but most of those days have already been used. So every rain day will push the completion date back. Indiana University is encouraging dining services workers to get a hepatitis A vaccine as a statewide outbreak continues to grow. More than 330 people in the state have been diagnosed with the contagious liver infection since November. As dining workers return to campus this week, the university is increasing hepatitis A education. Because that is something that can spread the disease. If somebody has hepatitis A, that can spread through handling of food and then get into the population that way. There are currently no reported cases of hepatitis A at any of IU's campuses. Monroe County, however, has five cases associated with the outbreak. Two Monroe County Sheriff's deputies remain on paid leave after shooting and killing a Bloomington man. The officers were serving a drug-related warrant when they say Daniel Boyer came outside and pointed a semi-automatic handgun at them. The deputies fired their weapons, killing Boyer. The incident is the first officer involved shooting in Monroe County in about a decade. Both deputies were wearing body cameras, but the footage hasn't been released. Well, a dispute between the county and city of Bloomington could impact plans to expand the Monroe County Convention Center. As Barbara Brozier reports, county commissioners sent a letter to the mayor this week saying they believe he violated their memorandum of understanding. The memorandum of understanding spells out how the city and county will collaborate on the $72 million convention center project, which includes plans for a privately funded hotel. A convention center steering committee recommended the county work with Sun Development on the project. In a letter to Mayor John Hamilton Tuesday, county commissioners say he violated their MOU by telling that developer he would seek proposals from other hotel developers. President of the commissioners, Amanda Barge, says the MOU is now considered null and void. We outlined a process for the convention center expansion, and one of those is working collaboratively. And we were concerned because the city contacted the hotelier without letting us know. In a letter responding to the commissioners, Hamilton says he didn't violate the agreement and that Sun Development wasn't selected as the project's hotel developer. He says it's important to find the best partner for the project. Once the tax was passed, numerous, we've had at least two specific uh, hotel developers who've said we'd like to build a convention hotel. Hamilton says he hopes to revisit the MOU. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. Five times as many people in Indiana are employed in the clean energy industry compared to fossil fuel jobs. That's according to a report released this week by the nonprofit Clean Energy Trust. Indiana ranks second among Midwestern states in wind energy employment. The majority of jobs in green energy are in energy efficiency, and 17% are in manufacturing hybrid and electric cars. Joe? All right, Lindsay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Craft breweries are on pace for a record year. Ahead more on the growing market in Indiana. Salmon are the first genetically engineered animal to be approved for human consumption. The fish will be produced here in Indiana. Ahead a visit to the new Albany facility. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. 
Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Craft breweries are still on the rise even after more than a decade of growth. 2018 is likely to have the most brewery openings and closings. Breweries are working to set themselves apart in this competitive environment. The founders of Big Woods Brewing are celebrating their newest destination, a one-stop shop just miles from where they started in Nashville. The goal is to really be able to um, uh, bring a group, bring your family here and just spend a day if you choose to, to really just enjoy everything we've got going on. Hard Truth Hills is meant to be more than just a brewery and restaurant. The more than 300-acre site features tours, hiking trails, campfire dinners, and tastings of their beer, spirits, and food. Big Woods Brewing business partner Jeff McCabe says the location pairs the scenery with their unique dining experience. The next tour beyond the distillery tour is what we call the Get Lost Tour, where we take you out in the woods in an ATV, and uh, we can have a tasting out in the woods. It's one of several innovative microbrewery approaches popping up across the state. Bloomington's Upland Brewery has opened locations in Carmel, Broad Ripple, and Columbus while expanding their offerings, including a line of sour ales. Some breweries throughout the state are offering specialty beers, like an Eclipse-themed beer released last year by 450 North Brewery. And places like Switchyard Brewery are embracing the small batch experience by making funky brews like their Lavender Blonde Pale Ale. McCabe says the difficulty comes when breweries try to increase the size of their operations too quickly. So I think that's part of the challenge uh, and part of the reason that some breweries go out is they try to go to scale and they're not adequately capitalized or don't have a business plan that supports that. He says they're in the process of building a stage that will face the outdoor restaurant seating to take advantage of the local music scene. And with us to discuss the Indiana brewery business is Pete Batuli, president of Upland Brewing Company. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. So maybe you can give us a little better perspective, especially here in Indiana, of breweries, mm -hmm. the status right now, and do you feel that competitive crunch? Yeah, uh, right now uh, we're getting close to 150 breweries in, in, in Indiana, um, and that's quite a bit uh, relative to other states as well. Um, and the competitive landscape is definitely um, has changed over the last three to four years. Um, we were established in 1998, so 20 years ago, uh, not many breweries in Indiana. Um, but uh, one of the things that we've been doing a little bit differently, um, I think where, where other breweries are even seeing success, um, and really this applies to across the country, uh, is, is in the tap rooms. So um, overall, craft beer is still growing quite a bit. Um, larger regional breweries, uh, volumes are, aren't growing as much, uh, but smaller breweries like us uh, and uh, breweries that have uh, on-site um, tap rooms and restaurants and brew pubs, uh, there's still a lot of growth opportunity there. So uh, that's been part of our business for years. Um, we first re um, did our first, I guess, uh, satellite location in 2009, and now we've got locations in Carmel um, with our restaurant there, Columbus, Indiana. Yeah, so I mean, you, you, you've been growing, but what about some, some of these smaller breweries? What do they have to do? I and mean, we're, we're seeing them pop up you know, all over, and even some rural parts of Indiana, mm -hmm. to be able to stay competitive and stay in business. Yeah, I think um, having really quality beers, one, one big thing that small breweries need to uh, focus on, um, something that um, we've grown and established over the years, but um, starting up a brewery and having some sort of uh, lab, um, even on a really small scale, there's things that breweries can do to make sure that uh, the beer is, is really well made because uh, that's one thing that will help repeat businesses, that great experience tasting a really high quality craft beer. Um, some other things, um, you know, that in terms of uh, uh, packaging and sales, um, having a lot of capital go into bottling sure. and canning, uh, that's something that um, is challenging on a really small scale. I'm thirsty now, I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here, I appreciate no it. No problem. A breed of high-tech fish is coming to Indiana, and the company producing it has hopes of changing the aquaculture industry. Samantha Horton has the story. The small town of Albany, Indiana, is an unlikely location for a salmon production facility. It's surrounded by cornfields and is miles from any body of water. The fish that will be grown here are just as unusual as the location. Massachusetts-based Aqua Bounty will produce a GMO salmon that it says will grow faster than freshwater-raised fish. Uh, it does so because we've given it the ability, using the same biological process that regulates growth in the unmodified salmon, uh, to grow about twice as fast, reaching market weight in about half the time. 
One expert who testified to the FDA as it was considering Aqua Bounty's case says the protein in the fish is the same as other freshwater salmon and poses no human consumption risk. You know, as an animal breeder, we breed for fast growing animals all the time. I mean, if you look at a chicken today versus 50 years ago, you know, they grow more rapidly um, through conventional breeding. And this is just using um, biotech to do the same things. We're not using uh, coastal waterways. We're not putting antibiotics and medications into the water. Uh, our fish are in a controlled environment. We don't need antibiotics. We don't have to treat for sea lice. During a tour of the facility, Stotches points out a number of precautions the company's made to prevent any of the fish from escaping. This is the most contained facility probably anywhere in the world, anywhere in the industry. Uh, this is above and beyond anything that exists. And the fish's genetic makeup also makes it unlikely they'd survive, let alone breed outside the facility. The fish cannot get out into wild, um, into the ocean, and they're also being raised as females and, and triploid, which makes them infertile. Um, and so um, that really um, is a containment approach to prevent any uh, escapement and interbreeding with the wild fish populations. But Aquabautius had to swim against the current of groups that oppose biotech fish due to environmental and health concerns. <laughs> There have been studies that look at the safety of genetically modified animals, but some of the critics call them inadequate. So rather than realize that they had a bad test because they couldn't detect anything, rather than do that, uh, both the company and the agency concluded from that data that there were no differences in growth hormone levels between the, the treated and untreated fish. But Stoddish sees his company as a pioneer in an increasingly crowded world. There aren't enough terrestrial resources or aquatic resources to be able to meet the protein needs of those 9 billion people. Still, stores such as Kroger, Target, and Aldi have already announced they will not sell Aqua Bounty's biotech salmon. The Albany facility, which used to be a conventional fish farm, is still being renovated as company leaders wait on an import alert to be lifted, so GMO salmon eggs may be brought from Canada into the U.S. Once the eggs arrive at the facility, it will take about 18 months before the first batch of fish is ready to go to market. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Samantha Horton. And now, a new project from the WTIU newsroom, Inquire Indiana. We believe great journalism starts with great questions, so we're answering yours. Our first question comes from a viewer who wants to learn more about his community's history. Becca Costello found the answer. So my name is Richard Siasto, and I grew up here in Bloomington, and I wanted to know how Salt Creek got its name. Siasto grew up canoeing on Salt Creek and fishing in this area on the southern tip of Lake Monroe. And he's heard some rumors about where this creek got its name. Potentially there was some kind of uh, farming uh, accident or where some pollutants were released. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that would make it salty or make it be called Salt Creek. But the true story is a little less dramatic. To find out, we asked a local expert. My name is Don Hall. I'm the trustee at Salt Creek Township. And uh, I've lived in Salt Creek for 27 years. Salt Creek is split into two branches by the reservoir. And the history of the name comes from what's along its banks. People were drawn to this area originally because deer were attracted to the salt that became encrusted along the banks of the creek that ran north to south. In about 1822, two men dug a well and found brine. That's a salt and water mixture that can be boiled down to make edible salt. The men established a salt production business that brought a lot of commerce to the area for several years. In the early colonial days and then in the early national period when this area was being filled up with people, salt was a precious commodity. It's hard to get a hold of. One of the first roads in Monroe County was petitioned to go from Bloomington out to the salt works. And within a few years, officials established the township and named it for the salt production. Eventually, the business shut down, but the name Salt Creek became a permanent part of this community's history. And that's something Siasto can now share with others. I guess maybe I should have known that growing up here, but no, I will definitely, you know, tell people that I know the reason now. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Becca Costello.
We want to explore the questions you have about Indiana, and you could even be part of the process as we find the answers. Go to WTIU.org slash inquire Indiana and let us know what do you wonder about the Hoosier State, its culture, or people that you want us to explore. A new festival in Orange County is bringing national recording artists and regional musicians to the rural community. The inaugural Paoli Fest will also feature instrument making and gardening workshops. The event will take place at the Tomato Products Company building. The open air event happens this weekend. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu, and by WTIU members. Thank you.